Hello, my name is Dr. Simon Fryer, a consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. In theory, this is a very simple, straightforward epilepsy to talk about. Um, but as we will discover, there's much more than meets the eye with this. Please do support the channel before we get into this by hitting that subscribe button down below. Really do appreciate it and it really does support the channel going forward. Let's get into this. So uh, this is a very common epilepsy, so it makes up about 15% of the childhood epilepsies. In the UK, the incidence is about six per 100,000. It tends to occur roughly about the age of seven or eight, um, and usually um, will resolve about the age of 13 and usually before the age of 16. So it has a very well-defined onset and offset as well. In terms of development beforehand, usually it's normal. About 10% may have a history of febrile convulsions and there tends to be a male preponderance of about three to two. So more boys are affected than the girls. In terms of its expression, very straightforward as well if we understand the anatomy and let's dive into that now. So where it occurs, is in the Rolandic region over here, and that's at a junction between the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the temporal lobe, each having their own individual functions. So the frontal lobe area, which is affected uh, with this condition, is known as the primary motor cortex over here, and its role in life is to generate the signals to initiate movement. We have the primary sensory cortex behind that as well, and it mirrors the primary motor cortex, but in terms of receiving signals of sensation from the limbs, from the face, from the trunk, and so on. And then we have the temporal lobe, which has a whole multitude of different functions, but importantly for our purposes, language is very important. And in fact, when you think about the organization of the different structures, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, it's very important that language actually occurs round about here. So let's move into the homunculus. The homunculus is an important uh, concept about the organization of the brain, which was first mapped out uh, electrically by Penfield and Baldry in 37 and published in Brain in that year. And there are different areas of the brain which are dedicated to doing very specific tasks mapped to different parts of the body. So um, for the primary motor cortex, and in fact for the primary sensory cortex, um, the body is mapped out in a, a mirrored way. The area over here um, towards the top end is relating to the hand. There's a lot of space which is dedicated to the thumb. So not only are the different zones uh, mapped out, but the amount of processing power dedicated to different bits of those regions will vary according to the importance. So it won't really surprise you that we have a lot of space dedicated to our thumbs. Really important in terms of the delicacy of, of what we can do manually in terms of our manipulations. We then have that followed by the head, um, particularly, and I note here, the um, lips over there, and then the tongue beneath that, um, and then the swallowing muscles just below. So as I've said uh, just a moment ago, in terms of where language sits, language sitting over here, and the areas associated with uh, mouth movements, very, very close together, um, and makes complete sense in terms of how those are organized. So in terms of how these are expressed, the, the seizures, given that the seizures are arising in this zone over here, it will not surprise you if we're talking about focal sensory motor seizures starting in the face. Um, so usually um, starts around there, it may start with oropharyngeal symptoms, so sensations um, in the cheek, the tongue, the lips. Um, people may be making strange noises as those muscles uh, go out of um, uh, usual control, maybe speech arrest, salivation, and that may also spread to other regions as well and even generalise too. In terms of when they are occurring, they tend to occur in sleep or just afterwards. They can occur during the daytime later on as well, but those are the peak times of when they occur. Quite why they occur um, in sleep is, is a very interesting question. It can also be associated with a range of other issues as well, apart from the actual epilepsy itself. So um, we've talked about the uh, temporal lobe having an important role in language. 
emotions, memories as well, but um, specifically in terms of language, there may be specific issues in terms of reading and speech for children who are affected by this epilepsy. And there can also be issues relating to attention. In fact, ADHD is particularly common behavior, cognition uh, and emotions. So there are lots of different associations with this. So in terms of the tests, a bedside clinical evaluation should usually be physically unremarkable, although for those cognitive um, evaluations, they may not be. The EEG we'll talk about in a little bit more depth in a moment, uh, has very specific features. And then the imaging usually is in its broader sense is unremarkable, but we'll get back into that in a moment. So in terms of the EEG, this part of the talk is really for uh, the neurophysiologists or the neurology uh, residents and interns who might be wanting to learn more about this. Um, so we usually we are looking at interictal activity and we are looking at centrotemporal spikes and, and sharp slow waves as well. It's very important that we see um, some positive dips in the frontal leads um, and that the maximal negativity is occurring in the central temporal regions. Now these may be unilateral or bilateral, they tend to be activated by sleep quite a bit, but then discharges may also occur outside of the centrotemporal zone as well. And these are all from the ILAE uh, website. Now the things which aren't mentioned specifically over there is that they may actually vary a fair bit between EEG. So you may find the discharges occurring on the left hemisphere in one EEG, and then if you did it again, you might find it in the right hemisphere, or you might find it in both. So there can be a fair bit of variability in terms of where those discharges are happening. But there's another aspect as well, which is they have a very particular uh, dysrhythmic nature to them as well, which does, in my opinion at least, set them apart um, from some of the other more focal um, epilepsies. I've talked about there being typical um, expressions of this, but there's a spectrum beyond the typical as well. So we call those atypical, and the features of that may be daytime only seizures. There's prolonged TOS uh, paralysis, so a weakness as a result of um, the actual seizure. Status epilepticus is an atypical feature. Let me be very specific, atypical features on the EEG in terms of the background, if there's focal slain, for example, um, the location of where those uh, discharges are occurring, if they're bilaterally synchronous, and they may sometimes be three hertz spike and wave complexes as well. So those are all atypical features. And it's important to realize that if they are atypical, they tend to also be associated with more moderate and severe um, associated um, problems in the language, attention, behavior, cognition domains, which may even be permanent. And in fact, this is a lovely slide over here um, from uh, Lee and colleagues, uh, which sets this out in its pure uh, form, um, where the prognosis uh, for growing out of uh, this epilepsy and the neuropsychological deficits is excellent in its purest form. Um, if it's atypical, um, then the prognosis will be good still, but not perfect. Um, if there's status epilepticus with it, uh, then fair, Landau Kleffner um, syndrome poor, or if there's continuous spike waves in sleep, then uh, very poor. In terms of the genes, um, there are lots of genes that have been potentially implicated with this, and I think it would be fair to say that there is no standout gene and it's likely to be polygenes uh, responsible and we don't really understand um, quite why this is occurring. In terms of treatment, um, some good news with this, treatment is not always necessary and that very much depends on the age uh, of onset, um, the frequency, um, so how often kids are having these seizures, the severity of the seizures as well, um, and tolerability to anti-epileptic medications. Now, some kids may um, present uh, on the milder end of this uh, a bit later on in, into the uh, time frame and timeline of this epilepsy and there may be no need to give treatment. Um, other kids may have it more severely and may benefit from the treatment um, and that will be very much patient specific and you'll have to speak to um, the treating physician if you are a patient or parent of a patient watching this to work out what the best treatment option is for your child. And there are lots of different treatment options which are available in terms of uh, medications. There's a lovely Cochrane uh, review 2014 if you're interested in uh, details of those. These may include things like oxcarbazepine, uh, carbamazepine, uh, Keppra, uh, topiramate and so on. Um, so again, this is something very much uh, which it will be patient specific and in discussion with the treating physician. Let's move now into the more 
controversial aspects of this and um, what's in the name. Um, it's quite a mouthful really and I tend to think of this as the AKA epilepsy and apologies if I'm going to be a little bit controversial over here but let's just review a little bit its uh, evolution in terms of how it's been named. So I think it was back in the 50s that it first garnered the name Rolandic epilepsy when it became apparent that this was the region where the discharges were coming from uh, and, and the epilepsy was arising from. And as it became more understood in terms of how the epilepsy would self-resolve at specific ages, um, it became known as benign Rolandic epilepsy because kids would typically grow out of it. And then at some point, um, the Rolandic got removed and the EEG feature of centrotemporal spikes got put in in its place. So it became benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. However, around about this point, it became apparent and better understood that because of the associated issues with language, attention, behavior, cognition and so on, it wasn't so benign because the kids were more um, more recognised to be affected by this, certainly whilst they were having epilepsy and particularly with the more atypical presentations of it uh, afterwards as well. So then it became known as epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes and then childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes because it was realised this was a child's epilepsy. And then more recently, it's now known as self-limited childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. And this is incredibly confusing um, for referrers because depending on when you train and when you learnt about it you'll be referring to it with different names. Uh, personally I think of it as Becht's and benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. I still get lots of referrals uh, from older clinicians talking about benign Rolandic epilepsy and the question is is well what is the benefit of moving from one name to another name and the truth is is that the shifts in names are actually done for very good reasons um, in terms of trying to better classify these epilepsies in order to try and improve our treatment approaches to them. So there are very good reasons for doing this, but whether the benefits actually make any difference in terms of the, making that diagnosis is a subject beyond that which I can discuss over here. Moving on, it's also known um, in the most recent literature sometimes as perisylvian network epilepsy which is quite attractive from a classification uh, perspective because then you can then put one two three by them um, but the issue with that is that we then move back into the anatomical perisylvian network um, type of description of it and so should one really just go back to calling it Rolandic epilepsy dropping the benign aspect of it the other thing to say as well um, and here I will be going out on a little bit of a limb is I'm not sure it was best to uh, mix in the EEG feature of centrotemporal spikes into the actual diagnosis of the epilepsy itself. The reason I say this is because um, the brain has only got a certain set amount of um, features for any particular uh, irritation or um, insult that can occur to it. And so the fact that there are centrotemporal spikes does not necessarily equate to this particular epilepsy. There may be a variety of epilepsies which present with centrotemporal spikes, but it does not equate backwards, um, if, you, if you're following me with that. But I won't go into that in too much detail because my opinion doesn't really count on this at all. Uh, but I, I just say this as someone who sits at the coalface of uh, diagnoses rather than an opinion uh, shaper. But personally, I think there is a lot of mileage to talking about perisylvian network epilepsies, uh, but then why talk about that when we can talk about Rolandic epilepsy? But that's where we are. Uh, we're now calling it self-limited childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. The next thing to talk about is the name of Rolandic epilepsy, just going back to uh, its original name. Um, and you might discover that it was also um, described by someone called Martinus Rolandus uh, just before uh, the 1600s. And um, the fact that he was called Rolandus and we call this Rolandic epilepsy after Luigi Rolando is just um, a coincidence, basically. Luigi Rolando was a very famous anatomist 
dedicated a lot of his career to uh, learning the anatomy and describing the anatomy of the brain uh, and it was named uh, this region uh, of the brain was named in his honor the Rolandic region um, and the fact that Rolandus um, described it many years before in terms of the epilepsy uh, has no bearing on the anatomical uh, description of where this uh, area is or how it was named and uh, it's quite interesting if you look into Rolandus uh, quite how he used to treat epilepsy with um, his alchemy and vomiting potions of uh, interesting uh, wines and so on. Um, so uh, that's a, an interesting one for the history buffs out there. In terms of the classification, we classify this now as a focal epilepsy. Um, it wasn't always the case, um, and to be fair, it doesn't quite behave as one. Um, and if you think about imaging in particular they're actually quite mixed findings so i've already said that broadly uh the, the basic imaging uh set doesn't tend to pick up things but there are um some papers with um a variety of mixed findings really um looking at the thickness of the cortical region so uh, as we mature the thickness of the cortical zones um, actually decreases so um for some studies um in this condition there may be excess thinning or excess uh, thickening um, and that can actually be more diffuse than just that Rolandic area so maybe in a frontal temporal and occipital lobes even so whether or not this is a, a true focal epilepsy whether it's something a bit more diffuse is uh, an important question which we still have to uh, get to grips with and also something called folding so as we mature the the brain folds on itself uh, and we get these gyri and sulci uh, these sort of peaks and troughs um, and whether the folding mechanism is is quite right or or, or not um, is again something that we have to get to grips with i hope you found that interesting um, it's a fairly straightforward epilepsy in the typical um, presentation of it certainly there's much more to be discovered and learned about it uh, whether in terms of the genes the imaging findings and even how we uh, classify this as well um, I hope that you uh, hit the subscribe button down below please feel free to ask questions as well on this particular topic I can't answer questions for individuals please uh, do keep it broad um, and about the condition in general if you do wish to do so all the very best, keep well and hope to see you in the next video.